Hello, everyone, and welcome to our online service. We appreciate you taking time to tune in today. Of course, you're always welcome, and it's so good to have participants who share this time together. Today's message is from the book of Revelation, specifically in verse number 15. The Bible says that the serpent spewed out of his mouth this flood to try to go against God's people. And you'll find out what that means. And so we invite you to stay tuned for this message this morning. Also, we want to encourage you to go to northernlightcc.org or you can contact us here at the church at P.O. Box 757 Hayward, 54843. It's always a blessing to be with you. And today we would just like to say a prayer together and ask you, God, to meet you right where you are, and pray that your ears will be open to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches in this day. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are here, that you are among us. We pray that you rain down righteousness upon your people. We ask you, Lord, to open our ears and our eyes spiritually to be able to see and hear and understand what the Spirit is saying to the churches today. Bless us, we pray, in this time. In Christ's name, amen. Enjoy the program and the praise, and God bless you. So this morning I'm going to look at something that is on my heart, and I've been thinking of this, and I just feel like I'm supposed to communicate something to you today. Now, usually what I do is I go through um, and keep what I say very, very, um, it's called hermeneutics. Every once in a while, somebody comes up, little Roberto, he'll be here in the second service. He's like, Pastor, do you have a class on hermeneutics here? And uh, hermeneutics means the way that you interpret scripture. And so um, I'm, I'm going to look at some types today and, and shadows and l look at some principles, okay? So what we share today, I'm not saying, especially when you get to the book of Revelation, this is exactly what John was thinking, what God was saying to him. However, we're going to use it as a pattern. For example, when God came to Abraham and he said, Abraham, I want you to come out of Ur of, Ur of the Chaldees, actually it's uh, Ur of the Chaldees, and uh, I want you to leave your family, I want you to go to a land uh, that is... Um, full of milk and honey, and I'm going to give you this land. Remember Abraham said that? Now, say Linda comes to the Lord, and she just gets this picture, like Abraham called, was called by God out of his family, out of Earl, out of all of the culture that he was in. That's like Linda. Okay, so when the scripture was put into, was God thinking, yeah, the ultimate thing is going to happen in 1980-whatever, no, but it, it is a very clear, like a picture of what happened to Abraham happens to us. Does everybody understand that? So we're going to look at something today that um, I, I'm not saying that it is the ultimate interpretation of what John the Revelator was trying to communicate. But I am saying it is a picture of what's happening in the church today and to the upcoming elections. Okay, so um, I just want you to look at that, and, and again, I'm, as we look at this, but nevertheless, I'm not apologizing, but what I am saying is this is an incredible picture of what's happening right now in our United States of America, okay? So in that thought, I would like to um, just have a word of prayer and ask the Lord's guidance upon us this morning. This is a continuation of last week, and so let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for our wonderful praise today, Lord. Thank you for uh, the opportunity we have to look into the sacred scriptures, and we do pray, Father, that you will put uh, sinews and bones and strength uh, upon this body of Christ of yours, Lord, and that we are stronger and clearer and more calibrated than ever, Lord, to rise and shine in this day. And we ask you, Father, today as we look into the perfect law of liberty to open our minds, to open our spirits, to treat
truth, Lord, and to cause us to overcome by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, loving not our lives unto the death. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So I'm going to give you a kind of a background here this morning and walk you through this. So our first, uh, let's see, our first scripture is in Psalm 124. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote some other ones. So you might want to just jot down a few scriptures because um, but i got to kind of get you on the same page as uh, a particular thought that I want to communicate. And before we do that, I really need to lay a foundation here for we who are here today. So this is Psalm 124. This is one of the Psalms of Ascent. The Psalm of Ascent means they sang it while they were going up the hill to Zion's hill. Remember David? Here's how smart David was. I can't even say that. Here's how much revelation David had from God. He passed, he bypassed his Old Testament. In fact, he took Zadok the priest and he said, Zadok, go out and offer up the sacrifices according to the law of Moses. Meanwhile, we're going to have church, we're going to have the presence of God right on this Ark of the Covenant was brought to the hill of the Lord, right? We call that Mount Zion and the presence of the Lord. And so it's like, while Zadok the high priest is taking care of that Old Testament law, David just goes, that's taken care of. Let's bypass the church. Let's bypass the millennium. Let's bypass foreverness and reach right up into heaven and let's worship God like he wants to. And that's why, that's one of the reasons David, though he had his mistakes, he was a man after God's own heart. He really was. He did things well. History says... At that time, the most powerful nation of the world was Israel. The most uh, war-strengthened, conquering nation of the world was Israel. The most prosperous nation of the world in those days was Israel, unequivocally. Because the Bible says, the Lord of hosts went with David in every fight that he fought. Right, So he goes into the Philistines and he has this unseen army of angels that go before him. Now there were swords and there were deaths that were all of that, but there was much, much more than that. There was a conquering of the demonic gods of that day and God of Israel, Yahweh, the one, the true and living God, was brought to the foremost place of that particular country. Now, I think England probably did that in a over part of their history, and they said the sun never shines, or the sun never sets on their kingdom, and right, they, they controlled India, and Africa, and America, and South America, and they're still all over the world, and, and it was because when they fought after the Lord, and they were in the right place of the Lord, God bless that little island of England, and then it came over to America, and in America, my understanding is that God made a covenant with the early founding fathers back in the 1600s. And then when we became the United States of America, it wasn't just another nation. It wasn't just another revolt. It wasn't just another statement we're a nation. The God of the Bible was reflected all over our constitution and our way of life. Everybody understand that? Say amen. That, that's a real important concept for you to to understand. Doesn't mean everybody in America is a Christian, but it does mean that America was built on Christian principles. And we need to, that's who we are, that's who we were, that's who God destined us to be. Never has there been a nation that has supported missions and sent more missions to the mission field than the United States of America. Never has there been a country that has had more Bible colleges and seminaries, right? The first 103 colleges and universities of the United States of America were Bible colleges and seminaries. Do you know that? That's very, very important. To, that's not in China. That's not in South America. That's not in uh, Japan or any other nation where you have this huge reflection of the glory of the Lord in embedded in our constitution and the framework of our thinking. Now, that only goes as long as we as a people continue to reflect that. So what happened in 1962? There was a lady by the name of Madeline Murray O'Hare, and 
I've met her son. In fact, I've played his uh, his testimony on our broadcast here before. And she is the one who got prayer out of public school in 1963. I think the Bible went out in 62 and the prayer went out. Well, if you take the Bible out, what happens to a church if you take the Bible out? What happens to a church if you take prayer out? It becomes just a social gathering. And then in the process of time, the city fathers don't know what to do. So they come, they buy it, and they throw a big sign on there. And it says, museum, go see what it used to be. So how many want to have that happen to America? How many want America to be a God-fearing, light-shining, gospel-embedded, amen, people group that is influenced? The Bible doesn't say that we need to become a Christian nation, but what it does say is that we are the light of the world, and light makes a difference. We are the salt of the earth. Salt influences. So what is our job? To shine. What is our job? To influence. That's very important that we do that as Christians. Now, there is an assault in America right now, and it's not just a political warfare. It is a spiritual battle that is going on right now, not for the body, the physical body that was World War II, World War I, and for the soul of our nation. I think that was in the 60s, and now we're battling for what we're calling the spirit. What spirit is going to dominate this nation? As long as I have breath in my body, and I hope you say the same thing, as long as you have breath in your body, soundness of mind, you'll take everything you can to bring the Lord Jesus Christ and to make him known. Larry mentioned today how many people, in fact, I was counting for a while, how many people passed away and did not have a funeral. I lost track, Larry. And the, the idea used to be you could be the worst sinner, drunken, whatever, uh, right? And, but at the end, you would still come and give at least God one more opportunity to speak over your life, right? In a good way, whether, however you live. That was kind of the thoughts. And now it's like, well, it doesn't really matter. Uh, death doesn't mean anything anymore. And it's just, uh, uh, just something that we have to either do and have a big bash and drunken party or don't do anything at all. That is not God, that is not the Bible, that is not Christianity, that is not even dignity to the human race. Can somebody say amen? No amens, I'll say amen. Amen, amen. I got to carry my amens with me and I'm good at it. Amen? A little kid last week after the service, first service, said, Pastor, you said amen 31 times. He said, last time I was here, you said it 52 times. So, praise God. But who's counting, right? <clears throat> So there's an assault. There's a spiritual battle that is going on for our nation right now. Now, as the people of God, we can do, make it real simple, one of two things. We can be passive and just kind of see what happens. Um, we can partner in with the enemy, or we can make a stand for God. And I want to talk to you about entering into heaven's war. Heaven's war. Not the war of the United States. I'm not saying militant. I'm not saying pick up guns anything like that. What I am saying is to be vigilant warriors of the Lord Jesus. Now, we took last week and we talked about how God, sometimes he is the one who encourages, helps along, and then he says, I'm roaring as a lion. He comes. And so the lion and the lamb, as someone said at the end of the service last week. Psalm 124. Are you there? Say amen. If it had not been for the Lord on our side, may Israel now say, had it not been for the Lord on our side, when men rose up against us, men being the thinking of man coming against us, when they would have swallowed us up, when they, their wrath was kindled against us, then the what? But I say flood. Then the flood would have overwhelmed us the torrent would have passed over our lives. Then the surging waters would have gone over us, and in essence, we would have died. But you see the picture? What's the picture? We're the people of God. We struggle, but the Lord steps in. And this is so beautiful in our personal lives. We might be having an issue in our life or something that comes along, but God steps in. 
Can you say amen? And when God steps in, it makes a difference. You can be financially broke and destitute and have all kinds of issues financially. If God steps into your battle and you follow after him and you go his way and he steps into it, just like he did for David, right? He goes into a battle, but God says, the Lord of hosts is going in. And David never lost a battle, never lost a battle. Not one, not a half of one, not a partial of one, never, ever, ever, not once. Unless he had sinned against the Lord, which he did, and he had his issues there too. Point being, when the enemy comes in, like a flood, let the Spirit of the Lord raise up a standard. Now this continues, and he goes on to say, Blessed is the Lord who has not given us prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird out of the snare of hunters. The snare is broken, and we are escaped, and our help is in the name of the Lord. Somebody say amen. Get that beautiful psalm? Isn't that good? All right, let's go to the New Testament. Now, to enter into this battle that is before us, this is in Luke 9. I'm going to Luke 9. I think that's on your PowerPoint there. Luke 9. So, when we come to the Lord, we cannot come to Him on our terms, but we must come to Him on His terms. If we're going to enter the battle that is before us, we become soldiers. How many here have served in military in the United States? Would you just raise your hand right now? Amen. We got three, four, five guys who are here who, and God bless them. Give them a good hand. Amen. You have done well, and we do honor you. Praise the Lord. This is a day to honor those who have fought for us in the past. This is the day to honor our policemen who are fighting for us every single day of our lives. Can you say amen? God's going to give us creative ideas to help and minister to our people. I've talked, prayed with. We've had our chief of police right here from this pulpit. We've had our sheriff. How many remember that? We honor. We say, well, how can we pray for you? They tell us and we do it. I hear people pray it all the time. Just partnering with people who are doing the work of the Lord, which is part of it is to fight evil. Now, when you become, you go into the military, what's the first thing they do, if, especially if you have long hair? They take great pride and delight in cutting all that hair off. Why? And do they give you, well, I want to wear blue today and uh, black and red socks and... Uh, Maybe a Hawaiian t-shirt. Like, no, that's what we, not what we do here. What do we do? We shave your head off. We give you a uniform. And you make that uniform shine. You make those shoes shine. Somebody say amen. And we don't go into the military on our terms. We go into the military on their terms. We don't decide what's our favorite food. We take what is given to us, right? Now, you're going to be a soldier. Now, you have to understand something. If you're going to be a soldier of the Lord, you can't go and be a soldier of the Lord and make a spiritual difference on your own terms. There needs to be some humility. There needs to be some of that losing identity to find identity to be who we are as soldiers. So what I want us to see here, and I'm prefacing this, that people came to Jesus and they wanted to go their own way, not unlike today. So let's go to Luke chapter 9 and verse 57. And the Bible says, as they went along the way, Jesus and the boys, a man came to him and said, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Man, this casting out demons, this healing the sick, this large crowd, I like that. I want to be a part of that. I want to go to the army and shoot a gun and ride an airplane and do all the fun stuff. Is that what happens when you go in? No, it's not what happens when you go in. So Jesus says to him, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. What does that mean? That means if you're going to follow me, you have to understand something. You're going to have to leave civilian life 
and you're going to have to pick up a military mindset and you're going to have to lay some things down if you're going to follow me. Now, let me make a differentiation between a believer and a disciple or a warrior. There is a huge difference. I still believe John 3, 16, say it with me, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is a solid, it is meant to be, it is a promise for the whole world, whoever exists, whoever trusts and believes and repents and comes to Jesus, we find eternal life. Somebody say amen. But that's not God's ultimate goal. That is the floor, not the ceiling. Okay? So, when we come to the Lord, there's another step. This is the step of discipleship. This is a step of being a warrior. I may expand on that later, but right now we'll just look at the fact that Jesus is calling this man and he's like, I want to do that. I want to go with you. Well, understand there's a price to pay. Then Jesus said to another man, follow me. But he said, let me first go bury my father. And Jesus said, leave the dead to bury their dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. What was he saying? He wasn't saying, I want to go say goodbye to dad. What he was saying is, Hebrew culture is, I stay with my dad in his business until he dies. After he dies, then I'm free from him. And Jesus is like, hey, if you're going to wait for circumstances to line up to become a disciple of Jesus, forget it because it's not going to happen. The kingdom of God comes now. And when the son of God of the universe puts his finger out and says, come and follow me, let the dead bury their dead. Find somebody else. Find a sister or brother or neighbor and you go do what I'm calling you to do. Does everybody understand that? Say amen. Right? So he's like, Come follow me. And then he says, no, let me first. Everybody say me first. What is embedded in every American and every non-American and every person in the entire universe? I want to do it my way. In fact, if my name was Frank Sinatra, I would write a song and I would call it, please, I want to do it my way. Well, if you're going to be a disciple and a warrior for Jesus, you're going to have to get rid of the me first syndrome. He goes a little further. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their dead, but you go now preach the kingdom of God. And another one said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go back and say goodbye to the boys. Jesus said, no one who puts his hand to the plow looks back. And if he does look back, he is not fit for the kingdom of God. So Jesus calls us and he's like, it's not about your past. Does everybody understand it's not about your past? All of us in this room, I'm sure, would have enough hideous things in our, all of our past to spook the devil himself right? It's not about our past. It's about the work of salvation. And it starts at salvation and it continues when we respond to the call of God upon our lives. Amen? So in this passage, we see that Jesus is destroying the me first mentality. And he's saying, no, there is a cost if you are going to Enter in and be a soldier of the Lord. Now, there are a lot of people, I think, who are Christians, who love the Lord, who have a good way. I have a gentleman in this city who owns a business, and he's since retired from the business. But my wife and I are looking at some things in his store. He comes out of his office, and he hollers, and he says, Give that man a deal, he says to the salesman. Someday, he's going to bury me. So they gave us a good deal. I'm his pastor. He hasn't been to this church maybe a time or two, but I'm his pastor. I pastor probably more people outside of the church than I do inside of the church. It's true. And a lot of them are not even Christians. But I'm, my conviction is every person on this planet needs a pastor, a shepherd, right? They, they do. That man recognized it. I don't know where his faith is. I've talked to him several times. And, 
and uh, trust that before he leaves this world. But he's already thinking in those terms. My heart, my soul, and my prayer is that he will come to believe in Jesus. And I hope and pray that he does. But that doesn't mean he's going to be a soldier in the army of the Lord. There is a difference. Let's go to chapter 12 of Revelation now. Wished I could read the whole chapter, but the first few verses talks about this dragon and he's basically kicked out of heaven. And there's a picture, he said, I saw a wonder in heaven of this woman. Now, some people would say that the woman here is the children of Israel, national Israel. Other people, I'm more inclined myself to think it's the church of the living God. But whatever it is, or if it's one or both, we can all come to the conclusion that he's speaking about the people of God, be they natural Israel or be they spiritual Israel. Right? And so he's talking about this woman and he sees this dragon that's also there. And the dragon, does anybody not know who the dragon is? Okay, it says it right here. Uh, let's see. The dragon. Um, now is salvation. So, so th this dragon is, let me, let me just read. All right. Uh, let me pick up in verse 7. Then war broke out in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail. Everybody say they did not prevail. Everybody say they will not prevail. Amen. How many know the devil is not going to win this battle? The Lord. Amen. That's why the Lord's people, we must enter into heaven's war. So the word war is mentioned several times. Now, if there's war on he in heaven, don't be too surprised if it happens here on earth. But they did not prevail, neither was a place for them in heaven any longer. And the dragon was cast out. If you don't know, here it is. That ancient serpent called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world, he was cast down to the earth and his angels were cast down with him. And if you go back and you read the early text, you'll find out a third of the angels or what we now call demons. Then I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, now is salvation and power and the kingdom of our God, the authority of his Christ has come. The accuser of our brothers has been cast down before us who brought accusations day and night. He has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Everybody say the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Praise God, that means that you need to be washed in the blood of Jesus. It also means that you need to have a testimony of somewhere down the line where, down the line where you were four years old or 40 years old or 85 years old where you met Jesus as your Savior and you were washed in the blood and you can articulate that to some level, something changed in my life. I could take you to the place. I could take you to the time. I could take you to the moment. I could give you the exact date when my life changed. I was saved. August the 8th, 1976. 23 East Bracklin. Right side of the pulpit. 8.08 p.m. I can tell you exactly what happened. Powerful. And I changed. Amen? Got rid of my cigarettes, booze, drugs. Don't need that stuff anymore. Why? Got a new life. Going a different direction. Now, it doesn't happen that dramatic to everybody. Sometimes it grows on you. It doesn't matter how it happens. What does matter is that it does happen in some degree. Amen? So, we overcome the enemy on those uh, statements that were mentioned in verse 11. Therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you 
in great wrath because he knows his time is short. I want to suggest to you right now the reason we're having all of the turbulences happening right now in our major cities in America is because the devil knows his time is short. He's headed for the mouse trap. He's on his way there. He knows there is a doom coming. And so he's got to act out everything that he can. Now, I have come to this conclusion before. I thought back in the 80s, <laughs> this has got to be it. We're in lawlessness. I've never seen lawlessness happening in our country as it is happening right now. I go back to our eldest people, Lois and others who are in far up in their 80s and pushing towards 90 years old, and I ask them what happened in our nation. They said they've never seen anything like this before. That tells me that the enemy is worried and he knows his time is short. Does the Bible not say that? Now, I'm not saying the Lord's going to come this afternoon, but we are, we're, we're working toward that, ladies and gentlemen, the coming of the Lord. One word is going to fell this devil. One word from God and it's over for him. And he knows it's over. His demons know it's over. There is no redemption for the devil. There's no redemption for demons. But there is for human beings. Somebody say amen. So, verse 13. Look carefully. Please look carefully with me. Or that might, yeah, is that 13 or 15? When the dragon saw that he was cast down to the earth, he persecuted the woman. Now, who is the woman? The woman ultimately depict the people of God. So he persecutes the woman, the people of God, who gave birth to the male child, who is Christ. And the woman, to the woman, was given two great wings, like an eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, where she is nourished for times, times, and half of times in the presence, uh, excuse me, from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent goes after this woman, this dragon goes to defeat her, but God comes alongside of her and gives her two big, beautiful wings of an eagle. Let me just ask you a question. What is our national emblem as America? She has taken and she's brought into the wilderness, right? She's brought into the wilderness, and so he's like, he's like snarling. He's so angry. Do you please understand that every attempt of the devil against you, he will overplay his hand, he will be destroyed, God will stop his ever move, he will give you wings, he will give you the ability to either overcome the offense or be delivered out of it. Somebody say amen. amen. So when, after I became a Christian, I was supposed to go to Chicago. I was working for Suzuki at the time. And so I uh, went down there and the guy who I discipled to be a real good drinker, um, he was with me, and um, here we are in the streets of Chicago. Well, on our way down there, we had some plans. I won't tell you what those plans are. But I go to this guy, and he comes to me. I'm a new Christian. I mean, this happened Sunday night, and this was like Thursday of the next week or something. And so he comes, and he says, hey, do you want a drink? I'm like, no, thank you. All right, if you're a drinker, and you say no, thank you, most people say, okay. And he says, no. And this guy's old enough to be my dad. He says, you're going to drink that. I said, no, I'm not going to drink that. He said, you're going to drink. And it's just his face started to contort. And I'm like, holy cow, there is another entity of darkness much beyond this alcohol where this guy is carrying out like this. This was a demonic spirit trying to bring me back into this former lifestyle. Does everybody understand that? We're not just talking platitudes, mental understanding, uh, scripture verses that we stick away somewhere for some time. No, there's a battle going on. And this guy, and, and I'm looking at the time, and I don't know a whole lot about the spiritual warfare stuff, but I'm like, there is another entity in that man trying to do this. I've never seen this happen before. This is weird. And that man is weird. Because he's influenced by the enemy. 
So please understand, when you witness for the Lord, you take a step for the Lord, you're going to get some pushback from the devil. Everybody say, so what? Overcome it. Overcome it. That's what it's all about. They overcame him. They overcame him. Our whole job is to be overcomers. Got this bug and I just killed him. That's what the devil does. He's like a little bug. He comes and he messes with our notes and you just... Right? That's what little demons are. They're like little bugs that bother you. Amen? And I'm not going to talk about bees. The last time I talked about bees, I got stung and I went into a... Me and my body and... So I'm just going to kill them and move on. Somebody say amen. So we see, and I could go into more of that story, but I just saw demonic forces coming. And then there was a little preacher out on the streets of Chicago, downtown. And I was with my friend, and he's like, hey, we're going to go have a good time tonight. And he's, I'm going to take you to some, some great places. And so I, I crossed the street this way, and then I, and this street preacher was preaching about Jesus and preaching about the Bible. And all I knew is I needed something. That guy probably went home discouraged that night. And I was like feeding my soul. And I'd cross, and I'd cross, and I'd cross. And I, I kept going in square so I could hear this preacher. This guy said, what are you doing? What are you, what are you up to here? I said, well, you wouldn't understand, but I really like that preacher guy over there. He's helping me a lot. So he takes me to a place. And, and anyway, what he wanted to do that night, it didn't happen. He says, you're going to be a lot of fun. I'm taking you home, which he did. And that man today, that man who I discipled in the wrong way, he, uh, we were at a crusade and I saw him. He was there and I went up to him. I said, man, I'll, I'll go with you. I'll, I'll, I think it was a Lundstrom thing or something. I said, I'll go with you to the front. No, I don't want anything to go. Jesus, I don't want to go that way. My wife is a Christian, but I don't want anything to do with this. Broke my heart, walked away. We're having a trustees meeting over here, amen? And we're there, and all of a sudden, two doors bang open. About five, seven guys come walking in. One of his guys are this man, his name is Marty, he comes in. He said, Pastor Tim, I just want you to know we're on a fishing trip going on up here. I want you to know that I'm saved. I'm born again. I went forward in church. Somebody say amen. Yeah, so God has a way of doing that. There was a spiritual battle going, but he won it. Amen. He's still doing well. His family and it was reached. It's just amazing. So this dragon, look down to verse 15. He saw that he was cast down to the earth. He persecuted this woman. This woman was given two great wings of an eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to be worship, uh, to be protected, nourished for time, time, and a half a time from the presence of the serpent. God comes through for us. Amen? Then the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood. What did we read about in Psalm 124? The enemy comes like a flood. Had it not been for the Lord, we would have been overwhelmed. We would have been drowned. This this flood would have destroyed us. Do you see the imagery? It's exactly the same in Psalm 124. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened his mouth and swallowed the flood which the dragon spewed out of his mouth. So what do we see here? This dragon or serpent, it's used both ways because it's depicting two different things. But the dragon comes against this woman. Who is the woman? The people of God. Who are the people of God? You and me. We are the people of God. And this enemy comes. He can't get her because God gave her a provision to fly into the wilderness. So he sees afar off and he's like, I'm going to spew. Question, what comes out of our mouth? words. What is happening right now in our culture and society? God has preserved the gospel, I believe, in America. He's used America to take all of the, uh, the, the scriptures, and now other nations are finally getting a hold of it. But for, for decades, for centuries, America has been huge in bringing the gospel to the other Nations of the world, we're huge in preparing people. We're huge in Christian education. That's who we are. That has defined us. We, that's been who we have been forever. And that's why people want to come along and say, it's called cancel culture. 
They don't want to know. They have no desire for you to compare what happened in history. They don't care. They don't want what we had. They don't want Jesus. They don't want God. They don't want the Bible. They don't want Christian families. They don't want male and female marriages. They don't want what we call the natural family. They hate it. They're out to destroy it, and it's called cancel culture, and it is part of this lie and deception that comes out of the serpent's mouth to destroy God's people. And he throw in some media, some movies, some music, and you find exactly what's happening in America right now. Satan has opened his mouth full of lies, deceptions, to try to do what? Carry us away with the flood. Just like in Psalm 124. But there's one little thing he doesn't know. Had it not been for the Lord on our side. Let Israel now say, in case you missed it the first time, had it not been for the Lord on our side. And I'm here to tell you this morning, the Lord is on our side. The Lord will battle with us. Our question is, will we battle with Him? Will we stand with Him? Are we willing to be soldiers? Or do we still want to live our civilian life and pick our own clothes and pick our own style and pick our own way? Or are we willing to have our hair shaved off, our uniforms put on and say, I'm getting rid of me first and I'm saying, Jesus, you are first. I enter this battle and I will stand with you. Now listen carefully. There are different generations that are raised up at various times. I am part of what's called the baby boomer generation. It starts in 1946 and it stops in 1964. And if you're not a part of that generation, if you're older than that, if you're born before 1946, you are very blessed people and you have been a tremendous blessing. In fact, they call you the worker builder generation because nobody built anything like you did. Today, we are in the midst of a battle. Donald Trump, incidentally, was born in 1946. His generation was the first of the baby boomers. It's very obvious in our nation what's happening right now in terms of what that dark side wants to be. It's not Republican or Democrat, although there are some inferences there. But it is a movement. It is a desire to destroy our United States of America. And the Bible says that the earth opened his mouth and swallowed up this flood of deception. Question. Now here's where I'm going to go with this. There are other people groups of birth and generations and that kind of thing. There's another one that goes from 1965 to 1979. That's called the X, Generation X. And the reason they call it Gener Generation X is because abortion started there and they lost half of their people and they're, they just call them X because they did not know what else to call them. Baby boomers, we're the ones who were building after World War II and all of that. And so Generation X, they couldn't just figure out what to do, so they called them X. That's no kidding. And then after that is what's called the Millennials. That's from 1980 to 19... Well, to 2,000, uh, roughly. And not all of these are exactly the same numbers, and there is some overlap there, obviously. But what I'm sensing and what I'm seeing is that at this next election, God is going to raise up the baby boomer generation to make a difference. 
in the polls. How do we make a difference? Three ways. Number one is our voting. Have the mind of the Lord. Now, if you're not uh, in this particular generation that I'm talking about, the baby boomers, pray for us. Pray for us. Just say, Lord, bless the baby boomer generation. This is our opportunity. The second thing is to be vocal. Our vote, to be vocal or let our voice be heard. Speak up in conversations. Make a difference. Amen? Why? Because generations before us were embedded and were very strong in Americanism, but in 1950, in uh, 54, 55, they added a couple of things in the 1950s. One is one nation under God. That wasn't in 1776. That wasn't in 1886. It wasn't in the early 1900s. It didn't happen until the 50s. One nation under God. Our coins that say, uh, our, our pledge says one nation under God. Our coins also, it was put in in the 1950s. You go back into coins, which I have a lot of old coins, and um, some of you have a whole lot more than I do, but you'll find there are all kinds of coins, and they don't say, in God we trust. That was put in the 50s. Why? Because in this generation, in fact, in 1960, in 1961, the divorce rate in America stopped going up. It actually started going down. And the only thing that interrupted that is we took prayer out and we took Bible out in 62 and 63. From that time, divorce rates continued to escalate for like 20 years, 25 years, more every single year. Why? Because we can't live a decent life without prayer in the Bible, in our public schools, in the public squares. And a lot of people took it right out of the church itself. They don't preach the Bible anymore. They don't have prayer meetings anymore. Because it's too archaic. Let's cancel that culture. And you find in the Bible where Moses and Aaron, and when they're confronted, Moses has a staff and he throws it down and it becomes a serpent. And Jannies and Jambres in the New Testament, they're called these other soothsayers from the dark side, throw their staffs down and they became serpents as well. Only something very significant happened. What happened? The serpent of the staff of Moses, ate the other ones up. They swallowed it up. And I believe, and we'll see what happens, but I believe that we're going to see in the newspaper after this election that never before has there been a generation that made such a difference in our vote, our vocals, And our values. Our values. Why? Because we were saturated with Christian influence in that day. I was there. We could not drink our milk until the teacher prayed. My sisters went to public school in Minneapolis, Minnesota, no less. And they taught them. They reached, took the Bible out and said, young ladies, this is how you live your life. It was part of the public school where you took to the Bible itself. Now, I'm not saying it was a golden age by any stretch of the imagination. What I am saying that somehow over the years, it multiplied and there was a strong Christian influence in our nation like never before and never after. And we're still here on this planet and we will make a difference. Somebody say, man. Well, you say, well, I wasn't born in that age. I wasn't born in that time. Well, the Bible says God brings us and he, the, the Bible says of David that he was born at that particular time. We're born. Paul says a man born out of due time. 
when the fullness of time, Christ, God sent Christ into the world. He was born, Galatians 4, 1, 2, and 3 in there. He says, God sent Christ at the appointed time. He was born into a generation. And I believe God has set this up at this time to stop the lies, the deceits. We use our values. We use our voting. We use our voices to swallow up the lies and the deception of the enemy. My question to you today is, will you be a soldier in the army of the Lord? Will you enter into heaven's battles? So what does it mean? Here's what it means in just regular plain talk. When you hear the news, you stop and pray. I watch the news. I don't hit the button and shut it off. Shucks, that's what happened to our nation. Isn't that too bad? That is not a soldier. That is not a warrior. That is not the response God wants. Here's what he wants. Oh, yeah, devil, we take authority over you and we pray for people in Washington, D.C. We pray for the next elections. We pray for truth and righteousness to be here. Amen. You see somebody who is not living as they should. You pray for them. You intercede to them. You open your mouth to the best that you can. Sometimes it's not appropriate to speak. Sometimes it is appropriate to speak. And when it is, we need to lift up our voices and we need to let our values be known. Some people are afraid right now to even let their opinions be known for fear of what some people will do if you even dare to vocalize your political stance or your spiritual understanding. So do you want to be a soldier of the Lord? Are you willing to lay down your life? Are you willing to step up to the plate? Willing to pray, willing to be vocal. Stand with me if you would. Praise the Lord. Welcome, brother. That's all right. Just in time for second service. <laughs> Glad to see you, Kip. I'm going to ask you to lift your hands to the Lord this morning. Just say a simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus Christ, go ahead and say it. By the help of the Lord, I want to be a soldier of the Lord. I want to be a disciple of Jesus. I want to enter into heaven's battle. And use the gifts and talents and the equipment that you put into our hands. Help us to overcome, Lord, by the blood of the Lamb by the word of our testimony, and loving not our lives unto death. Lord, help us today to be soldiers of the cross, to enter into the battle, to be salt and light, to make a difference, to influence this world, to preserve this nation, to help the next generation, to let Christianity be strong in this land, and to be promulgated in the nations of the world. In Jesus' name. And if you believe it this morning, can you say amen three times? Amen, amen, and amen. Amen. Lord's heavenly blessings be over you. May you be overcoming power. May the Spirit of God be with you. May you do well in your Christian walk. Amen. God bless you.